Number one lesson, save. I know it's not revolutionary, but it was quoted by one of the revolution's founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin. A penny saved is a penny earned. Subconsciously, we give more weight to money earned than money not spent. We give higher value to a $1,000 pay increase than a $1,000 that we decided not to spend. But the fact is that $1,000 is $1,000 whether it is money earned or money not spent. And in a way, at times it's actually easier to not spend the $1,000 compared to trying to earn that extra $1,000. My wife and I often do this whenever we debate a large purchase. I would tell her, Hey hon, I think it'd be nice if I could upgrade my desk. I've had the current one for over 10 years now, and I don't like the scratches. I think I can be more efficient with my work if I have a new desk. What do you think? Being the wiser partner that she is, she would ask me, How many hours would you need to work in order to earn enough for that brand new desk? Or in her case, how many hospital shifts she would need to complete? Oh, 18 hours of blood, sweat, and toll? It's strange how when we reframe the purchase to how much more we need to work, miraculously, the current desk seems completely fine. So next time you find yourself debating whether to spend that extra money on a new item or a new toy, think, how much do you have to work to earn that? My guess is that you'll likely default to saving. Number two lesson, another obvious one. Don't buy things you don't need. Buy what thou has no need of, and before long, thou shall sell thy necessaries. We might think back to the 1700s and think, Oh, people weren't surrounded by consumerism and capitalism back then like we do now, so they didn't have the same issues we're facing today. However, Benjamin Franklin didn't say this without reason. Even 300 years ago, people were constantly buying things they didn't need and couldn't afford. At the time of British colonialism, Americans were voracious consumers of British goods. Colonial newspapers were filled with advertisements promoting British wool, silk, guns, lead, tin, chalk, coal, paint, furniture, liquor, and cheese. People back then were really no different from us today. They wanted things. It may not have been the latest Apple Watch or a new Tesla, but people still wanted to buy things. Number three expense. Watch your expenses. Beware of little expenses. A small leak will sink a great ship. Benjamin Franklin might have discovered the latte factor even before latte was invented. When it comes to our budget, we tend to dismiss small expenses as being trivial. What is eating out a couple times this week? They're only $30 or $40 per meal. What are a few subscription services? They're only $20 each per month. $5 cup of coffee here and there? No problem. They're only $5 after all. However, what we fail to see is that while small expenses individually may not be much, when they accumulate over a period of months or years, they can be quite a bit. One year, when my wife and I were super busy with work and young kids, we literally drank coffee like water on a daily basis. We would visit the coffee shop two or three times a day without really thinking about the cost. I knew it didn't feel right, but I dismissed it as what are a few $5 cups of coffee here and there. Well, later, when I actually went through all my credit card transactions for the year and tallied up how much we really spent on coffee, it came out to several thousand dollars. We drank enough coffee to essentially buy a cheap, used car. This led us to investing in a latte machine at home, which did not cut down our coffee consumption, but definitely cut down our overall coffee cost. Go through your budget and see what small expenses could be a leak in your overall expenses. Maybe subscriptions? Individually, they may not seem much, but when you have five of them, Netflix, Hulu, Disney+, Apple TV, and HBO Max, don't be shocked how much you're spending annually on streaming services alone. At the end of the day, don't let these small expenses sink your ship. Number four lesson, ignore the Joneses. The eyes of the other people are the eyes that ruin us. If all but myself were blind, I should. Again, when we think back to people 300 years ago, we might assume people didn't have to deal with the same issues we're facing today. Social comparison, the need to keep up, and the need to look like we've made it. However, what quotes like this show us is that people 300 years ago dealt with the exact same issues we're facing today. Yes, they didn't have TikTok or Instagram, they were still concerned about how other people perceived them. That's the reason why many young people were tempted to buy the latest furniture, liquor, and cheese advertised in their local newspaper. Here's another one of Benjamin Franklin's quotes. And it is true folly for the poor to ape the rich, as for the frog to swell in order to equal the ox. Vessels large may venture more, but little boats should keep near shore. Let's not try to be that frog that swells in order to equal the ox. The ox is large because of its genetics. If we as a frog try to grow like an ox, we either look ridiculous or we'll pop from all the pressure. Number five lesson, avoid debt like the plague. Rather go to bed without dinner than to rise in debt. Again, nothing revolutionary here, but people struggled with debt 300 years ago and it hasn't changed much today. The sad fact is that average Americans pile on debt like a kid at a candy store. We finance our clothes, our cars, and our homes with it. Some debt have time and a place, but be careful not to let it consume our lives. Think what you do when you run in debt. You give to another power over your liberty. What gets me most about debt is how it affects our freedom. If push comes to shove, I'm sure many of us can live with a lot less. Survive in a smaller home, less food, and less stuff. However, when you have debt, you're always obligated to the debtor. You might want to leave your job to start your own business, but when you have a ridiculously large home mortgage, you can't. 
Your bank owns you. You need that paycheck in order to fulfill your debt obligation. You might want to change your career field, take some time off and spend some time learning a new skill so you can pursue a new occupation. However, you can't because you have student loan payments from your last degree you need to continue to make. Don't let your freedom be constrained by debt. Number six lesson, another one of my favorites, invest in yourself. An investment in knowledge always pays the best interest. Ever since Benjamin Franklin was young, he was passionate about reading. All the money that he came to get his hands on, he spent it on purchasing books a man after my own heart. And he spent all his spare time accumulating as much knowledge about the world through the books that he bought. For a man who had only a few years of formal education, this self-investment allowed Benjamin Franklin to become a world-renowned writer, scientist, and a diplomat after his printing career. He was even able to leverage the self-improvement to a great contribution during the American Revolution. From 1776 to 1778, Benjamin Franklin was sent as a diplomat to France, charged with gaining French support for the American Revolution, a tall order by any measurement. However, he thrived, much in part due to his mastery of the French language and his enduring personality acquired through self-improvement. Don't skimp on self-improvement. Invest in yourself through books, classes, or any other forms of education. Benjamin Franklin showed by example that success can be born by diligent study. Number seven lesson, having no money should never be a source of shame. Having been poor is no shame. Being ashamed of it is. Being poor or having been poor should never be a source of shame. We tend to judge people based on their wealth. We automatically attribute someone who has money as being smarter, wiser, and just a better person. Whereas we attribute someone who doesn't have money to being lazy or lacking intelligence. None of this is true. Money is just a piece of paper or a number on a computer. It doesn't reflect someone's character at all. So not having money should never be a source of shame. We all start at different starting lines. And what matters is how far we progress in our own individual race, not in relation to other people. At the age of 17, Benjamin Franklin ran away to Philadelphia penniless. He had a humble beginning. With no money, he could have constantly lived in shame. However, he didn't. He progressed through entrepreneurship, lifelong learning, and eventually made a name for himself. And he was also never shy about his origin, who he was, and how he came about his success. Never be ashamed by not having money. Money does not reflect your character. You do. With strong character, you may accumulate money so you can buy more freedom and choice in your life. But lack of it should never be a source of shame. Number eight lesson, value time. Never waste time. It is your greatest life resource. Dost thou love life? Then do not squander time. For that is the stuff life is made of. Time, not money, is actually the greatest life resource. While you can make more money, either through more work or investments, you can never make more time. Once you use it, it's gone forever. So value time. Benjamin Franklin was known for his amazing work ethics because he valued time so much. Work while it is called today, for you know not how much you may be hindered tomorrow. Despite his later fame as a scientist and a diplomat, Franklin actually thought of himself first and foremost as a printer, all the way up to the end of his life. And he was without doubt one of the most successful printers of his time in America, largely due to his amazing work ethics. In his autobiography, Franklin noted that he often worked past 11 p.m. to get a job done, and that if necessary, he would stay overnight to redo it. In a town size of Philadelphia, people quickly noticed this extra effort, and Franklin's growing reputation lured customers away from his rivals. So be ashamed to catch yourself idle when there is so much to be done for yourself, your family, and your country. Number nine lesson, choose your friends wisely. Surround yourself with friends you share your values with. Benjamin Franklin was quite a networker in his days. Obsessed with self-improvement, he spent his life seeking out men and women who shared his high values and formed a mutual self-improvement group made up of tradesmen and artisans called Junto. At their weekly meetings, they asked deep questions like how they may be serviceable to mankind, to their country and to their friends, or to themselves. And they didn't just keep the group to discussions. They helped to establish a university, hospital, lending library, militia, firefighting brigade, Learn Society, and Insurance Company, all the while sending plenty of business each other's way. And it was due in large part to his networking with the right people that Benjamin Franklin was able to accomplish all that he did throughout his lifetime and become etched in the history books. Number 10 lesson, money is not the ultimate goal. He that is the opinion that money will do everything may well be suspected of doing everything for money. This is ultimately a quote about greed. It is easy to assume that more money will solve all our problems. Yes, to an extent, money can alleviate some of life issues. If you're struggling to make ends meet, more money will give you a cushion, more breathing room. However, after a certain extent, the joy that it brings plateaus. Yet, people can't help themselves and still strive for more. The financial crisis which began in 2008 is a prime example. Greed drew billions of dollars into risky and speculative investments such as subprime adjustable rate mortgages and mortgage-backed securities. People were promised impossible returns and they chose to ignore the risks because they were blinded by dollar signs. And because people were willing to do anything and everything for money, 
the crisis consumed millions of Americans into dire financial situations. Money is a good tool to navigate life, but it should never be the end all goal. Number 11 lesson. Aim for self-sufficiency. At the age of 42, Benjamin Franklin did something highly unusual for his time. He retired. He signed a co-partnership cool agreement with his foreman David Hall and established the first long-term passive income stream before it came cool to do so. Franklin was anxious to move on to other activities. However, he couldn't because he was tied down to his printing business. So he aimed to become financially self-sufficient. To be financially independent by building his printing business to a point where he could set up a passive income arrangement. At the end of the day, this is what mastery of money should buy you. More freedom and more time to spend the day however you see fit. For Benjamin Franklin, this allowed him to pursue his favorite activities such as reading, and the ability to pursue other ventures in the company of people with whom he shared the same ideals with. Number 12 lesson. And this one is close to my heart. Slow and steady path to wealth. Not divert my mind from my business by any foolish project of suddenly growing rich. For industry and patience are the surest means of plenty. Franklin was not an overnight success. It took him decades to move from a runaway to a print shop apprentice in both stateside and London, to opening up his own shop and ultimately turning it into a profitable business. During that time, he lived a Spartan lifestyle and was far more industrious than any of his competitors. Thus, he encouraged others to realize their dreams as he had with patient, steady effort. And because of his slow and steady path to success and wealth, Benjamin Franklin did not turn a kind eye to various get-rich-quick schemes that were put forth during his day. In one of his essays, Franklin went after those who spent their time digging for pirate treasure that had supposed to be left buried along the river. Men otherwise of very good sense have been drawn into this practice through an overwinning desire of sudden wealth and an easy credulity of what they earnestly wish might be true, while the rational and the most certain methods of acquiring riches by industry and frugality are neglected or forgotten. Don't get swayed by the get-rich-quick schemes out there. Focus on slow and steady. Thank you guys for watching, and in the spirit of slow and steady, if you want to learn why you want to get rich slowly, please check out my video here. Until next time, all the best.